students, ladies and gentlemen, here my colleagues. Let me introduce Dr. Herbert Cornelius, who will have a very interesting lecture. I have heard it about half a year ago. And therefore, he is here because the lecture was so, so nice that I decided uh, to give this information also to you. A good informatic evening, and let's start. All right, thank you very much. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I actually changed a couple of foils <laughs> from mm -hmm. half, year, half a year ago, but uh, I, I hope it uh, will still be, uh, still be very interesting. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Marvin Cornelius. I'm from, uh, from Intel, based in, in Munich. Um, I'm a director of advanced computing in, uh, in Europe, or uh, as it says, uh, Intel EMEA. Does anybody know what EMEA stands for? It basically stands for European, Middle East, and Africa. It's like the, the, the slice of the world. It's like when you have Europe in the middle, um, then you have the US in, in, on the left, and on the right, there's Asia Pacific. Interestingly, uh, when, when different people draw this map, if, if an American draws this map, then America is in the middle, Europe is at the right, and Asia is at the left. And you can imagine when, when, when people in Asia uh, draw the map, um, Asia is in the middle, Europe is in the left, and the US is in the right. So uh, <laughs> interesting how, uh, how people view, view the world. So in the next uh, hour or so, I, I would like to, uh, to give you an overview on what's, uh, what's going on at Intel, some of the developments, uh, some of the technologies, the trends we are seeing. Uh, and uh, <coughs> yes, please feel free to ask questions. I think we, we have a, uh, a good group. Uh, so if, uh, if it takes so long, we can, we can, uh, we can take the question offline and, and have a chat afterwards about that. Just um, to, uh, to get things uh, uh, straight, um, because I'll be talking about things which might be in the future, um, those things can change um, for lots of reasons. Uh, some, some of some products we have today, and that's fine, uh, and we, we are looking at, at, at products in the future, so uh, keep that in mind that as you go forward, things might change. Um, I, I talk about mainly about data center stuff, uh, which means uh, processor systems, uh, technologies for, for the data center. Um, nevertheless, we'll also touch a little bit on, on the mobile side as you would see, but uh, we'll focus on, on computing uh, on the data center, and especially in, in this area, which is called HPC, uh, stands for high performance computing. Anybody ever heard about high performance computing? Know what it is? Or, well, it used to be called supercomputing. The biggest, fastest, most expensive computer in the world uh, fall in this area. And to some extent, they are still uh, systems are still are in this area, but uh, as you will see, high performance computing has changed uh, a, little, a little bit. Um, and you can see in enterprise there are other big topics like uh, hot topics like big data and cloud and, and enterprise computing um, that that all uh, plays a role. But that's a different topic. I, I, I won't really touch. Uh, we'll focus on high performance computing. So why is high performance computing so interesting? It's so interesting because it has established itself as a third pillar for modern research, science, and engineering. Uh, it all started with experiments and observations in the good old days. Uh, people were just playing with things and trying things out and observing what happens and then draw conclusions and to develop certain things. Uh, at one point in time, um, the theory came, came, came uh, in addition. Uh, people started to build up a theory, a mathematical theory, how, how they think or how they believe things, uh, things behave, and then they kind of verified the theory with uh, experiments and observation. And that, that kept us going for, for quite a long time, uh, basically like uh, until 50 years ago. Um, then people started to, to use computers to, to basically do numerical simulations based on theory 
and uh, then also comparing results to, um, to, to experiments. And uh, nowadays, computer systems are so performant, so powerful, that you can actually simulate quite a lot. Uh, and you, you can simulate things you can actually not even do in, in reality. Um, like uh, testing what, what happens if, a, um, if an airplane crashes into a nuclear reactor. You don't really want to do that physically. Right? You don't want to really experiment it. You can, you can simulate it. Uh, or you can also simulate new drugs uh, and try to understand how, the, how, how they de behave. So numerical simulations in high performance computing are now a very well established um, yeah, pillar and, and method to, to, to development and, uh, and, and gain insights into, into, into complicated things. So one example here is a nice one is, is weather forecasting. This is where all those things play, play together. Um, you, you measure certain weather data right, in weather stations around the world uh, or in a country or wherever um, and then you basically you have a theory about the, uh, how the weather behaves or you think the weather behaves and then you do a, a numerical simulation and then you do a forecast. What will the weather be tomorrow in three days, in seven days? Right? And coming to Prague I looked at the weather and it said yeah, should be okay, should not really rain, 20% rain shower. Well, I still brought my umbrella, but luckily I haven't used it yet. Um, and, 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 and then you can basically, um, yeah, predict the weather, and then basically, once you have predicted the weather the next day, you can actually check how, how did I do with my prediction versus the actual weather. And use this data as in a feedback loop uh, into, your, into your theory numerical simulation. To, to actually get a better model and a better understanding. Um, but also there are other big things people do with high performance computing. Particle, particle physics, looking for the boson uh, particle. Um, yeah, looking at the, the, the global climate change or um, trying to simulate the human brain. Um, means the European Union just uh, awarded a project to, uh, to, to several organizations to, to come up with an, with an idea how to simulate the human brain and they are spending 1 billion euro on that o over 10 plus years and uh, giving, giving it to lots of institutions but uh, that's, that, that's heavy, heavy investment in, in trying to come up um, with something you, you, you can't really do before uh, using high performance computing in American simulation. Um, but HPC is actually more. It's, um, it, it became vital to compete. And uh, competition in the sense of companies competing with each other, like car manufacturers or drug manufacturers or any other manuf manufacturing company who produces some, some products, some goods. Um, they are competing with, uh, with other companies because others might have a, have a better product, they have a higher quality, uh, they have uh, maybe less material cost, uh, and uh, they use high performance computing in the area of uh, computer aided engineering or, or computer aided design and manufacturing. Um, we talked about climate, uh, we talked about medical imaging, drug design, um, uh, the search for oil and gas uh, or renewable energy is also a very big area, um, financial analysis, is analysis, even digital content creation like doing uh, Pixar movies. They use a lot of high performance computing to, to, to do the rendering of, uh, of, um, of, of their, their movies. So basically what we say is to compete you must compete. And that shows how essential um, high performance computing is uh, in, in, in this area and it goes even beyond companies. It, it, goes as far as econ economies compete with, with each other, right? And, and Europe is actually in a state where we, we, we have to, to use our knowledge base and try to, try to, to use it to, to our advantage versus, say, other areas in the world where labor costs might be, might be cheaper, right? So we, we need to use our knowledge to be, to be competitive and, and can use um, high-performance computing. So, there's one good thing about knowledge. Uh, it's, it's one of the things which actually it, 
it doesn't um, fatigue, it doesn't go away, it actually gets more the more it's used. That's, that's the nice thing about knowledge. The more you use it, uh, the better and the more people, people do it versus uh, other things you, if you use uh, water or, or other things, the more you use, uh, you, you actually, it doesn't get more. With knowledge, actually it gets more. That's a, that's a nice thing. But we, we have a dilemma. And you probably have heard about this dilemma. It's called the power wall. Uh, in the good old days, performance was was nicely related to the frequency of a processor. Right? We, we, we cranked up frequencies from, oh, I don't know, where did we start? 16, 16 megahertz, um, 33 megahertz, uh, 100, 100 megahertz, gigahertz, 3, 4 gigahertz. Um, but it doesn't continue um, because power consumption actually uh, is, is a, a it, is, it behaves about as frequency to the to the cube. So a little bit increase in frequency uh, gives you like a cubical increase in power consumption. And you can do it for up to a certain level, but once you reach a critical level, uh, then uh, the power consumption just just goes goes to hell. In the sense, it just gets too big. Well, you could say, okay, I, I don't care, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, most people actually care. Um, so we potentially actually could build a 10 gigahertz processor, but it would, it would, be, it would be too hot, right? And you would need too much energy to, to, to cool it. Uh, it doesn't make any economical sense to, to do that. So um, we have to find other ways to increase performance um, because uh, a lot of the, the application areas you saw before they, they require a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of more compute power than we have today. So, what architects of, of chips and, and processors came, came, uh, came, came up to was uh, why let's use per parallel processing, parallel computing. Let's do things in parallel and, and not, uh, not just uh, try to, to squeeze uh, the frequency, uh, do be smart and do, do things in parallel, because a lot of things in nature are, are actually parallel. Um, and it should be energy efficient, because energy costs are, are really uh, not going down, unfortunately. Uh, they are uh, best staying flat or going up. So if you want performance, you need to embrace parallelism on all levels. Uh, and I show you some of the technologies we are using at Intel to, to actually get perform, still get more performance using parallelism, uh, but in, a, in, a, in an energy energy efficient way. And I, I, I show you uh, where, where the journey goes, and then you, you, you I think you, you understand why why this is uh, why this is important. Energy efficiency is, is a is, is, is a very important topic in computing, and it's it's getting more and more important. So. But it's not, not only performance and it's not only energy efficiency, it's, it's also about ease of use, right? You can build a, a probably a very fancy computer system, but if nobody can use it, uh, it, it won't really do any good. Uh, and there are, there are lots of cases in history of computing where, where people came up with, with very fancy systems like the connection machine. Anybody heard about the connection machine? All just those blink, flicker, blinking lights. Uh, actually, it was in one of the science fiction movies. Um, it, it was nice, uh, but it was too difficult to program. Or very long instruction work. VLIW in uh, architecture was uh, had a time where everybody was so excited. Um, but uh, unfortunately, it turned out that in, in order to get good performance, you needed to compile your program with a compiler using this very long instruction word and trying to figure out how to, how to do things. Um, it turns out that the compilation of the program normally took longer than the actual run of the application. So uh, that's probably not the best way, uh, the, the best way to do it. So we want to make it e easy, as easy as possible. We want to, 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 to have high productivity. And uh, I think this is, this is overseen a lot. You also want sustainability. 
sustainability in the sense that once you invested time, money, and effort to do something, that you can carry it forward and not ask to change, to change it for the next generation because somebody came up with a great idea uh, and, and, and tells you, tough luck, you need to change everything. This is not going to happen, um, not in the software industry. Uh, software is, uh, changes much, much uh, slower than hardware, um, and especially, especially commercial software, uh, uh, they are not going to rewrite everything from scratch. There's no way to do that. So sustainability and productivity is also a focus. So whatever we do, we try to address those three, three areas, performance, energy efficiency, and ease of use. So what is the basis of, every, of everything? It's uh, process technology and materials. This is what, what Intro basically became about. Um, we, are, we are in volume manufacturing. Um, we were, um, we are, everything is based on what's called Moore's Law. I hope everybody heard about that. Uh, should be famous by now. <laughs> um, we see that, that we are still on track and we can, can continue Moore's Law for the next two, three generations of process technologies, process technology. And you see here the, the evolution of process technology in, in 1999, we went 180 nanometer, then two years later went to 130, 90, 65, 45 nanometer, 32, we are now at 22 nanometer uh, process technology. On the way, we invented a high K metal gate, we, we are using hafnium, we came up with a 3D tri-gate transistor, which is a very fancy design of a, of, of a transistor. And it's all about getting more performance and energy efficiency. And uh, luckily also get higher density because with every, with every smaller process technology, we are able to put more transistors on a chip. And then everybody says, hey, okay, I, have a, I know how to use those transistors. And uh, we have lots of chip designers at, at Intel and they, they all want to do something. That's another problem in it, in a, on its own. How do you use all the transistors in a, in a way that it benefits most people, most applications, most software? That's, a, that's an interesting question when you, when you think about it because you can, you can always do very special things for a special application, for a special algorithm, for a special segment. And that's, that's, that's not bad. But you really want to, to, do, to implement it in a way that it benefits more, more um, more applications. Uh, that's, that's always a big discussion. What do we do next with all those transistors? Um, and then you see, um, we'll, we are planning to ship the first product on 14 nanometer later this year. Uh, it will be very likely in the mobile space. Uh, but we, we have the factory up and running and uh, we will be, we'll be, we'll be going to 14 nanometer and we'll be ramping it in 2014 going forward. Um, we are researching 10 nanometer and also 7 nanometer is kind of on the radar screen. Those technologies, 10 and 7 nanometers, are purely in R&D stage, which means uh, it's, it's still research uh, and, and uh, people think how, how to develop things. Uh, and it takes a while to, to move the process technology from, from R&D into, into production. It normally takes like five, seven years. So, uh, so you know, we already started at 14 nanometer a couple of years ago. So you have, you have really a, a long, a long lead time. But doing that, uh, we will be able to, to, to benefit from, uh, from, 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 the, from the process technology, as I said, uh, getting more performance, getting uh, higher energy efficiency, normally means uh, less power consumption, and we will be able to implement new functionalities uh, with, a, with, a, with a chip as we, as we go forward. So I mentioned 3D tri-gate transistor. Um, this is the illustration uh, at 32 nanometer. Basically, you see this is a gate, uh, and the current flows here. There's a source and there's a drain, and then the gate basically switches on and off, and, and it, it allows the current to flow. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, even if you close the gate, there is some leak, uh, leakage, leak power, and um, um, with, with, with traditional materials, um, you, you actually have a problem here. Um, this is why we, um, we're using hafnium these days, because it has the right electrical characteristics. It, uh, it blocks 
So that the current, when when it should, uh, and it, it, it let it go uh, when it uh, when when it, when it should should go uh, with, with with very very low leakage. Um, and what you see is the gate and, and the, the, the the current basically is like a two dimensional flow. Um, the three D tri gate transistor actually um, introduces a silicon thing here. So basically, what you do is you take this this two D this two D plane and you kind of squeeze it and then it. it Kind of goes up in the third in the third dimension, and you see the the uh, when you when you look at the the area here is 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 about the same or a bit less or more uh, be, because you now have three sides. You have this side here, you have the other side, and you have a little bit here. But you see, you can actually make it much smaller, which is nice. So you can much denser. So uh, electrons don't need to to move uh, longer distances. They actually have uh, shorter distances, which means you use less power to move to move the uh, electrons, and then you have the gate here uh, to control to control this uh, this technology. So you can get denser, faster, and lower power. And you see here, this is a, a Rustam microscope um, picture from a 3D gate. This is actually the gate, and and this is the, the silicon fin going this way. So this needs to be turned around. Here you see this is a 2D gate. And then the current flows like in a, in, in, in a, on a planar way. So that's actually pretty, pretty, pretty fancy, and, and we are we are leading we are leading this uh, technology. Other companies are, are trying to do it with with FinFET technology, but um, some might have some um, some um, some results. But we are basically already in the in the third generation of uh, 3D tri gates. So that just gives us some some nice advantage. Um, also, what it allows us is to integrate more and more into the chip. Um, when you look at the history of microprocessor, it's the history of integration. Everything which worked and which was useful and good eventually got integrated into the chip. Uh, it, it happened to the 40-point units, it happened to the cache, it happened to the memory controller, uh, it happened with uh, PCI Express 3 I.O. Um, yeah, and going forward, uh, we will integrate more. We will integrate fabrics, network, switches, storage, um, uh, yeah, on, on package memory. Uh, so we, and we can do it because we have the technology to do it. And that will give us also more performance, uh, higher energy efficiency, and um, some, some, some very interesting functionality um, as, as we go forward, especially if you think to integrate some of the other uh, elements. Um, there, there, there will be quite some, some, some interesting technologies coming. Um, coming, coming in the future, but this is a trend. Uh, everything gets integrated more and more. So, and what we can do with it, we can basically target the architecture um, for for the for the segment. Um, when you when you want to use a processor in a smartphone, like an Intel Atom processor, in, in this Lenovo smartphone, um, it's optimized for energy efficiency. It's not really optimized for, for, for performance. It's pretty good performance. But its 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 main focus was energy efficiency. On the other side, uh, when we talk about the Intel Many Integrated Core architecture, you would see it's focused on high performance, but also in a reasonable power envelope. Power envelope is is different. I mean, here we are talk about like two watt. Here we talk about three hundred watt. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> um, the performance level is, is, is also quite, uh, quite different, as you can see. And then you have everything in between. You have the Xeon is a, is a server processor. You have the Intel Core processor for desktops or for mobiles. And so we can actually um, uh, design, design the, the, the products the, the, the depending on the, on the segment. Uh, and all in energy efficient, and this is where the title comes from, we'll, we can basically can go from milliwatts to teraflop whatever we want, which product um, we want to do. Interestingly, like two weeks ago at the Intel Developer Forum uh, this year, um, Intel announced the, uh, the Intel Quark family of SOCs. Uh, this is actually going even one step further to the left. When I go back, we, we are actually going here. We are, we are going even sub, sub what? Power consumption with this uh, with this processor, yeah. with this SOC actually. Uh, it's an open architecture, it, it, it's programmable with x86 software, uh, it's fully synthesizable, uh, which means you can automatically generate things. 
uh, and it, it goes into sub watt core uh, yeah, power consumption. And the idea is to foster innovation and creativity. This processor is meant for this Internet of Things. Have you ever heard about the Internet of Things? It's basically everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything connected to the, to the Internet. So what you could potentially do here, that's just an example. It, it, it doesn't exist today, right? You could, um, it's, it's very small. It's, it's like uh, one-fifth of the size of an atom processor, which is already very small, and, and, and about one-tenth of the power consumption. Um, you, you can um, put it into, into, into a fabric and, and, and wear it. And it, it, it behaves, it can measure things, it can control things. Uh, this actually allows you to, to do a, a lot of new and, 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 and uh, innovative things uh, and come up with creative ideas how to use, how to use a, a, a reasonable, intelligent, and performant processor um, in, in, with very low power consumption. Uh, and, and you can, uh, I think people will come up with very interesting, interesting solutions. Uh, Intel is also going to do, there was a press release very recently, um, we, uh, we, we, we are going to provide um, development platforms, um, especially to universities, um, to, to, um, to play with it and come up with, um, with ideas how to, how to use it uh, for, for different things. Um, yeah, just go to Intel web page and look for Intel Quark. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a nice thing. But we are on the other side now. We are now at, at performance. When you look at high performance computing, uh, as I said, it has changed. It went from pri 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 proprietary to industry standard. And you can see the evolution here. In the 60s, this is a controlled data machine, the Cray 1, the Cray 2. Um, this is actually an uh, Intel Paragon, a massively parallel machine. And basically today, we have clusters um, are, are the main architecture in high performance computing, using standard industry standard building blocks like a processor, memory, and storage, and interconnect in free band, 10 gigabit Ethernet, 40 gigabit Ethernet, um, what, what, what have you. Uh, and using industry standard programming models as well. Uh, also, well, I, I could actually come up with a table with all the different components, how they changed over time. Um, all the operating systems here were proprietary. N now, basically, Linux is the main operating system in high performance computing. So uh, this, this is, a, is a trend. And wh what is it good for? Well, it's good for because um, we, we, we just looked at, at the time between 1997 and 2012. Uh, when you look at the top 500 list, this is a, this is a list which will be published every six months, um, listing the, the fastest computer, uh, the no fastest known computer on Earth. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, every six months um, it, there's a new list coming out. The latest, the latest list is from, from June, uh, from June this year. Uh, I have one call on, on this one. Um, and uh, well, you, you see, this is like um, what is it? 15 years, about 15 years. In 15 years, we got a performance increase by a factor of 1,500. So we got 1,500 times more performance. Uh, um, as, as measured in this top 500 benchmark, which is Linpeg, um, over 15 years. At the same time, the cost per flop, per floating point operation, went down by a factor of 100, which means that uh, it, it, it becomes more affordable, which means that more people can use it. One of the problems in, in the good old days was that those <laughs> machines here, you saw, those were like multi-million dollar machines, um, and uh, not everybody could, could, could really afford it. N now, using industry standards, uh, a lot more people can use it, and a lot more applications and application segments can, can use high-performance computing. Um, at the same time, the power increase was like only in code 4x, which is not <coughs> ideal. Ideally, you, you would like to see this also going down. But um, that's not, not, not really the case. It, at least it's, it's increasing much slower than the gain you get in performance. So, and this is uh, basically what you want to do. You want to get more performance, but try to not increase as power as, as much as possible. Try to, to keep it at the same level or bring it down. <coughs> Will we be able to do it? We'll, 
we'll, we'll see as we go forward. So as I mentioned, the, the fastest system according to the top 500 list of June 2013 um, is, is a system which uh, with a peak performance of 54 petaflops um, peak. How much is a petaflop? 10 to the... Fifteen no? is, is, is a petaflop. Um, this is a peak performance. The measured performance is 33 um, petaflops on this Linpack. And this system consists of um, 32,000 Xeon E5 version 2 <coughs> codename Ivybridge processors and 48,000 Intel Xeon 5 coprocessors. And it's located in China. <laughs> um, this is currently the fastest machine on the top 500 list. Uh, uh, will be interesting, pretty, uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite <coughs> impressive. Um, so, what, what are people doing um, in this area? We are doing a lot of things. We are working on processors. Um, you, uh, show you a little bit. Uh, show you more on the coprocessor side. We are also working on fabrics and networking. We are active in storage, like SSDs and flash, and we are also active in the software area because, as I said, we want to make it easy. Um, so uh, we are we are using, yeah, we are supporting the standard, the industry standard um, software programming models, uh, as you as you will see, like uh, MPI for message passing, OpenMP um, for 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 threading or threads for threading, and we have additional additional um, offerings. In the area, like we have a, a Hadoop, um, an optimized Hadoop implementation uh, from uh, based on Apache Hadoop. Um, uh, we, are, we are we are also working on on the, on the Lustre file system. So we are kind of adding more components to make it, as I said, easy, easier, easier, easier to use. And uh, we announced uh, November last year. So it's a it's not it's almost a year ago. We basically we have announced what's called the Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor. It's a it's a processor based on, on a mini core architecture, and I go into more details uh, on, on this architecture. Um, this graph only um, should should show you that we basically have two lines, two product lines in, in, in this in the server space. It's the Intel Xeon processor. It's using multi-core technologies, and I'll I, I, I explain wh what I mean with it. And we have Xeon Phi, which is implementing many core. Uh, they have a lot of things in common, and have a lot of same characteristics, um, but the way it's implemented basically uh, is we call multi-core on the Xeon side, and we call many core on the other side. The advantage is that with many core, we are able to improve performance quite a bit and still be energy efficient. Well, that sounds almost too good to be true. There are some kind of drawbacks <laughs> or some compromises you need to do in order to do that. But we are actually able to increase performance in a, in a reasonable, reasonable power envelope, so being, 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 being energy efficient. Um, but we have those two lines, and they will continue at the same time. They actually complement each other quite nicely. So this is just a brief update on the Xeon line. Uh, we, we are going full steam ahead uh, with a TikTok model. Uh, in one year, we, we, we do a shrink, uh, for example, from Sandy Bridge to Ivy Bridge, which is E5 version 2 now. Um, and in, in on the, uh, do a shrink on the same architecture. And then we, we do an improved architecture on the same process technology. Then we do a shrink uh, and, and so on. So this is what, what we call the, tic, the TikTok model. Um, and um, new, fun new functionalities um, are coming through new instructions. We are adding to the instruction set. So we started with MMX somewhere here. Um, then we, we went through different versions of SSE, the streaming SIMD extension. Uh, we went to, to, to AVX, advanced vector instructions, um, to AVX2 on the Hessel architecture. And we are going to what's called AVX 512 uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, this already gives you some idea where we are going on the architecture uh, because when you change things in the architecture, you need instructions to, to, to execute it. To execute it. Uh, 
And so the, in the instruction set architecture is, is, is kind of representing what, what are the enhancements from a, from a, from a programming point of view. Um, so, as I said, we basically, Xeon is following the multi-core and Xeon Phi is calling the many-core approach. So what is the difference? The, the difference is that the optimization points are different, but they use common characteristics. Um, on the Xeon side with multi-core, we are still trying to make a single core, a single thread as fast as possible. So you see that Xeon actually uh, uses a lot of transistors to, to do a lot of speculative, speculative things uh, out of order, um, fast large caches, um, all the fancy, fancy stuff. Um, so why, why, do we, why do we try to make a, a core as fast as possible? A thread, a single thread as fast as possible. Well, the reason is pretty easy because there are lots of applications which are single thread which are not parallelized. And uh, especially a lot of commercial applications are. And a lot of scientific applications as well. I'm, I know quite a bit uh, applications, uh, very big applications, um, which are still single thread. <laughs> um, so this is why uh, Xeon uses multi-core. We use a, a, a moderate number of cores. It's 12 cores today. It used to be eight cores, it used to be six cores used to be four cores. Ivy Bridge, Xeon Ivy Bridge E5 version 2 has 12 cores now. Um, and, but each core is, is we, we try to make as fast as possible so that the single thread can, can execute as, as, as fast as possible. Uh, and it uses cores, threads, caches, and SIM. SIM stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data, uh, which means you have an instruction where you can, can issue the, the execution of, say, uh, four adds or four multiplies at the same time, four divides. So it's a single instruction triggering the execution of multiple data. Uh, the good old uh, brain machines uh, used a similar uh, approach called Vector. Um, they basically uh, didn't do it in parallel, they did it in a pipelining fashion. Well, today, uh, with Simbi, even Simbi, uh, the execution rules are also pipelined. So it, it, everything is, is, is pipeline. And, and, and now you, you even start to do more things at the, on the, at the same time. And, and it's a very energy efficient way to, um, to, to get performance. That's why basically all micro, all processor, all CPUs today uh, from, from different companies, they, they all implement simply in, in, in one shape or form. It's AMD, it's Spark, it's Power, it's even ARM is adding simply. To, to, to its instruction set. And as I said, the reason is that Simbi is a very energy efficient way to, to, uh, to, to get performance. On the other hand, Xeon Phi, um, here we are trying to put as, as much cores as possible on a single chip. And doing that, we are actually giving up single core performance. It's not that bad uh, because we are, um, yeah, we, we, are, we are also adding Simbi even more than here. So we are kind of regaining a little bit what we gave up by, by having lots of cores on the chip. Uh, but in, in general, a single core you know, in, in a mini core architecture is normally less powerful than a single core in a, in a multi core. And that's by design. Because the idea with many core is that you get the performance by aggregating all of those cores and threads. And guess what you need to do to do that? You need to parallelize your code. You need to parallelize your application, right? That's the way, and uh, that's what I meant before. It's, when you want to get performance today, it's parallelization. And it's parallelization across cores, across threads, and it's using SIMD inside each core. And you can go one level up uh, by cl via clustering, where you basically also have parallelism by, by having uh, more nodes and, and, and adding things. The good thing with clustering is that it doesn't matter how, how fast or how slow a single node is, you can always add another one and another one. So in theory, you can scale. You can scale very nicely. But then you basically, you, you, you have systems today where you have lots, several levels of parallelism. It starts 
on the instruction level, parallelism. This is what the compiler deals with. Then you have Cindy. This is where the compiler tries to deal with, but you sometimes need sometimes need help from the user, from the programmer, to use the Cindy units in, in each core. The next level is multi-threading across the cores. Uh, well, then the compiler here is kind of the compiler basically gives up. <laughs> it's kind of an NP-complete problem to do it right. So um, everybody is dreaming of this automatic compiler parallelizing code. It, it, it didn't happen for the last 50 years and it probably or might not happen in the next 50 years. But well, it's, it's, it's always difficult to predict, especially in the future. Um, and then you have, uh, as the next level, you have clustering, where you, where, where you have um, different parallel nodes. So you have lots of levels of parallelism, and in order to, to achieve high performance, you need to utilize all those levels of parallelism. If you don't do that, you will leave performance on the table. So if you, for example, if you do not use Cindy on, on the Xeon today, or on the core today, or on the Xeon 5, you, you easily you easily uh, lose a factor of 10 in performance. So 10x, you, you potentially could be 10x faster, or 8 to 10x faster, if you use Cindy. When you don't use it, you're basically already limited to one tenth of the performance, no matter what you do. So you should try to utilize Cindy. And when you have multi-core or even many-core, in, in order to get the performance, you need to use it, right? Well, if, if you don't, if your application, so your software is not parallel, uh, the software won't, and the hardware won't be able to help you. <laughs> this is why, why we try to kind of uh, preach uh, parallelism and parallel computing, parallel programming. This is currently the way, the way forward. There are no other known technologies. I, I wish we would know how, how we could avoid it, but um, currently, um, we, we, are, we, are, we are doing process shrink, we come up with new materials, we come up with new transistor design, but uh, parallelism, well, parallelism is not going away, as I said. It doesn't matter how fast or how slow you are. If you have multiple of them in, in parallel, you can always try to use them. So parallelism is, is, is the key in, in this area. So, what are the differences between Xeon Phi and, uh, and Xeon? <coughs> so what you see here, um, the Xeon has a higher frequency, 2.7 gigahertz versus 1.2 and a bit on Xeon Phi, but it has 61 cores versus Xeon has 12 cores. It has more threads, it has a wider SIM unit, uh, 500, 512 on Xeon Phi, 256 bit on, on Xeon. But besides that, they have they have caches, local caches, they have shared caches, which are coherent, um, they are shared memory, um, and uh, yeah, there are different memory capacity. You see the memory capacity on Xeon is much higher than on, on, on Xeon 5. You will see the reason for that is because um, we need very fast memory, which is very expensive, so you don't have a lot <laughs> of it. Uh, if you have a higher memory bandwidth, versus, versus uh, this uh, Xeon processor here. And you need this to basically feed, feed the, the, the cores and the execution units, otherwise they will just idle and don't do anything. But besides that, they all share the same, the same characteristics. Um, cores, threads, SIMD, uh, more or less, um, shared memory cache. So you can actually use the programming model, the same programming model for both. And um, because of the characteristics, you can see, um, depending on how much your, your application or your software can use Cindy and how much it, it, can, it can be parallelized, um, you, depending on the degree, you, you actually can, can compare when is a Xeon better than a Xeon 5. And it's, you can come up with, this is a very simplified uh, analysis, which basically shows when you are in, in a high degree of vectorization, Cindy and a high degree of parallelization, then Xeon Phi um, is faster. Well, it's designed for that, to do that. Uh, if you are, have, have a lower degree of, of Cindy and a lower degree of, uh, of, of parallelization, then Xeon is very likely faster. And well, it's because it's designed for that. And so you see that those Xeon and Xeon Phi basically multi and mini cores, they complement each other, addressing different workloads 
different um, different algorithms, different software, different applications. Um, so they work they work hand in hand. The good thing is you program both the same way. And the way you do it is you program on a higher level. You say parallelize, or you say vectorize to Cindy. You don't say parallelize for three cores. At least you try not to do that. Sometimes you need, but uh, you, you normally don't want to specify that. You want to make it flexible. So depending on how many cores you have, you can use all or all, 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 all part of it. Uh, and for Cindy, um, you leave it to the compiler to do the strip mining, which means the, um, when, when you have a longer vector, to basically split split the vector in, in, in pieces, which then are mapped to the to the execution units, 512 or, or 256. But you leave that up to the compiler. You say, vectorize this code, use Simly, uh, whatever the underlying hardware provides to you. And the runtime system um, uh, will do that for you. It will do the mapping from the abstract programming, parallel programming level, to the hardware, both for threading across cores and for for vectorizing, for vectorization using SIM. Uh, we have a nice package of software tools. The Eagle Parrot Studio looks at multi-threading uh, and vectorization optimization. And then we have Eagle Cluster Studio, which basically um, helps you um, in, in message passing um, parallelization uh, uh, across the cluster. Very nice, uh, very nice tools. So what is the state of the art today on the Xeon side? Um, it's a Xeon processor E5. Dash 2600 version 2, uh, code name Ivybridge. Uh, it's 22 nanometer, uh, up to 12 cores, um, up to 3.5 gigahertz, then you don't have 12 cores, but um, as I said, yeah, uh, some for some applications which are not parallel, uh, they still benefit from a, from a higher frequency. Um, this processor has a peak performance of 259 gigaflops double precision floating point, or twice as much which is like half a teraflop single position photo a single socket. Uh, in HPC, you normally have two socket nodes, so you have like a half a teraflop double position or a teraflop single position performance per node in a cluster, and then you have like thousands of nodes to, to get high performance. That's, that's nice. Um, Xeon Phi has higher performance because that's what it's designed for. Um, it has a peak performance of 1.28 tera, teraflop. A, tera, a teraflop is a uh, thousand gigaflops. <laughs> and a gigaflop is a thousand megaflops. <laughs> uh, so quite a bit. Uh, in double position, and twice as much, uh, basically 2.5 teraflop single position uh, for point. Uh, it uses up to 61 cores. There are different versions with, with different number of cores. Uh, each core has four hardware threads. Um, so it's a highly threaded architecture, and it comes uh, as a PCI Express card. Yes? Does the lower frequency mean that uh, this uh, Xeon Pi is slower with uh, single core applications? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, as I said, the, this is the difference between a mini core architecture and a multi core. A single core or a mini core is normally slower than, uh, than, uh, than a, a What's called a big core, is Xeon core. Uh, absolutely. So if you you can use you can use this processor on this on the card. I, I show you a little bit the physical layout. But if you only use one core, it will work. But you might not get so good performance as you as you would have have hoped. The performance comes when you can use all the cores, and inside the cores you can you can use single. So it's a co-processor because it sits on a PCI Express card. That's, that's from the physical. We come to the hardware part, to, to, the, to the piece of it. Um, this um, this Xeon Phi card basically delivers four to six gigaflops per watt. That's a that's, that's quite a good number. Uh, Xeon delivers kind of two, 1.5 to two gigaflops per watt. Uh, this is pretty, this is pretty, pretty reasonable. Pretty good. This is like state of the art. You can, you can, you can get today, especially for a fully programmable device. Uh, and remember this number. I, I, I come back to this number. Four to six gigahertz per watt. Yes. Well, does it mean that the power consumption is 256 watts? Uh, no. <laughs> the, this 
This is measured. Um, um, yeah, it, it depends on how you measure it because you, you, you normally measure the card, which is a processor plus memory. Um, so the the um, we, we we haven't published the, um, the the GDP of the processor, but when you when you know what what GDDR5 consumes, you can you can do a rough estimate what what it um, what it what it looks like. So for the six teraflops. So this is what the architecture looks like. So you, you have a processor, you have lots of cores, you have a uh, coherent L2 cache uh, between all the, all the cores, and then you have 60 memory channels going to GDDR, GDDR5. And the communication to the outside world is through PCI Express. This is a pretty, pretty simple, pretty, pretty straight, straightforward. This is a version of 60 cores here. Um, this is what the card looks like. Very standard. You have a printed circuit board, uh, you have the processor, then you have the, the GDDR5 memory around, and then you have some power management control, uh, and then you have uh, your PCI Express connection here, and, and that's it. And depending on the capacity, how much memory, you have memory on, 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 on the upper side, and you might have memory on the, on, on the, on the lower side of the card as well. This is what, what, the, uh, what, what a normal card looks like. Um, the, from an architecture point of view, those 61 core, up to 61 cores, they are, this is a, the dark box here, um, they are organized uh, in, uh, they are connected to a double ring. Each, each core has a scalar unit and a vector unit. This is where, where, the, where the Zindi is used. Um, it, it has its private L1 cache and a piece of a, of a, of a common L2 cache and a tech directory to, to keep track or of where the data are in, in the L2 cache. Uh, and then you have the memory controller connect on the double ring, um, to, which goes to, to, the, to the memory chips. And then you have a PCI Express logic, which is also connected in this double, in this double ring. But it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable uh, good, good setup. Each core, as I said, has a, a scalar unit and a vector unit. Uh, here you see the local L1 caches and the, the piece of the of the, uh, of the common L2 cache, and then it goes to this double ring, and you see the vector unit has is 512 bit wide, um, and there are some fancy, fancy things you can do. You can do automatic numeric conversion up and down. Uh, you can reorder, you can replicate, you, you, you can control with a mass register which elements to, to, to do. It's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty nice, uh, yeah, they call it vector unit. It's, it's really a single unit because it does it does those 512 bits in parallel. Uh, but because vectorization is a software way to use them, um, it's, 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 called, it's called a vector unit or, or a VPU. Um, the double ring actually you see is, is 64 byte wide, so it's 512 bit wide in, in both directions. Um, uh, there are additional address bits and additional um, bits for, for coherency for the, for the tech directory. That's a pretty, pretty, pretty big, uh, pretty fast um, interconnect on a, on, a, on a chip for those 60, 61 cores. And the memory controllers are actually interleaved. You might, you might have thought when you saw the original uh, illustration that the, the memory is sitting on, on, on two sides of the ring, so to speak, but it's actually interleaved. So the distance, so what you try is to, you, you, to try to optimize or make an equal distance Bit, bit, between cores and, and, and memory control. Because you get certainly cert some NUMA effects uh, depending on where the data are uh, and, and where, where the core is relative to its memory channel. But the, 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 the ring is organized in a way that it, it, it tries to, 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 average, to average things out. And not have people worry about it. Because you can, you can start thinking about, OK, how, how do I place my data and where? To, to get the best, the best distance, um, you can only screw up <laughs> to be doing that. The hardware is, is designed to do that, to do that for you, and give you like a, um, an, an, an average. So there are three different, uh, there are three versions of the Xeon Phi core processor, the 7, 5, and the 3 family. Sounds a bit familiar, right, if you think about cars. Um, uh, 7 is a, is a high-end, 
Five is like the, the optimized term for, uh, for performance per watt. Seven is performance optimized, and the third is performance per dollar optimized. All, all of those uh, coprocessor cards um, have a peak performance uh, at a little bit about one teraflop, and, and it, they consume different power, 225 watts to 300 watts. It's, it's all within this PCI Express um, specification. The cards, those cards here are, are, are passive cooled. This is an active cooled card. They are um, full length double width. Um, uh, all fits in PCI Express definition. There is a dense version where OEMs can actually um, do their own integration much denser. And some are, are doing it. And then there, there's also a version without any cooling where the, the vendor who's held it uh, can 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 use its own cooling system, maybe liquid cooling or water cooling or whatever fancy cooling technologies are available. Uh, but those those are the um, the options. Well, then the good thing uh, about Xeon Phi is that it runs it runs in a Linux operating system. So you have the you have the card which sits in a in a, in a, in a host system, right? Uh, but on the card itself, there's a, there's a processor and there's a memory, right? Um, it, it, it runs a Linux operating system. And with that, it can do everything a normal Linux, a normal Linux SMP system can do. It only happens to have like 61 cores and 16 gigabyte of memory. But besides that, it can do everything a normal Linux system can do. It has its own IP address, so you can communicate to it, to the card, uh, as if it as if it is a single a single socket uh, big SMP node through any communication mechanism using IP. Um, so you can you can offload your code as as you do on a GPU or, or on a DSP or an FPGA, but it's it's much more because it, it, it runs a Linux operating system. It's an x86 based architecture with a vector unit. Um, it basically operates as a as a standalone as a standalone node. This is basically what it looks like. You can log into it through uh, SSH or RSH, and, and then type uh, cat proc CPU info. And when you do that on this card, you get like six thousand lines of output. <laughs> Why? Because it has um, two hundred and forty-four cores. Linux six. There are 244 cores because there are 61 cores. Each has four threads, so in total you have 400, 244 threads. And, and Linux thinks, okay, hey, why not? It's a big SAP machine with shared memory, and you see all the threads here. Um, yeah, it's standard x86. It, it's it's a Linux SMP. It's a Linux SMP, and this basically shows you what you can do with this core processor. You can offload it which means you can say, uh, offload pieces of my code to the core processor, do the calculation, get the data back. Now well, that's kind of business as usual. But you can also use it as a native Linux node um, where you, you just run your whole application on it. And ideally, in this case, you use a lot of parallelism. <laughs> because, uh, and it will work. And you can still have some serial pieces of the code. It will still work, right? You only need to, what you need to avoid for performance reason is to have the serial portion come too big. And then it's better to run it on, on, on a Xeon host or only offload pieces to the, to the core processor. There are different ways to do it. It's flexible enough to support those mechanisms. And this node basically, it's Linux. It can, it can communicate to the Xeon CPUs or to the Xeon CPUs or to the Xeon Phi on another node through a network. Could be infiniband, could be 10 gig, could be 1 gig, whatever, right? It's Linux using IP-based uh, or double-based uh, communication in the case of, of infiniband. And the good thing is, as we said, you can maintain a single source code for both architectures uh, because you, you normally program on a higher level and, and let the compiler and runtime system do the mapping to the underlying hardware. And that's a big advantage to a lot of to a lot of software developers. To, to maintain a single source code. What happens normally when you when you when you when you use offloading 
to, a, to, to, a, to another device. Um, at one point in time, you start, you start from a specific version of the source code. And then you work on, on, on getting the source code on the, on, the, on the offload processor, whatever it is. At the same time, normally, um, people continue to develop the original code further. And then after some time, you, you, have, you have done this offloading, um, and you go back and say, hey, cool, I, I, I succeeded to offload my piece. And then the, 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 the people who are, who are working on the source code, they say, oh, too bad. We are, we are already on the next, on the next release version, <laughs> which, uh, which is not good. So uh, this allows you to basically work on a single source code, which means you can <coughs> still continue to develop the source code. And it, it works on, 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 on all the processes. So that's, that's really uh, a nice thing about um, Xeon Pi. And you see here, depending on what, what your situation is, you can only run on Xeon, or you can only run on Xeon Phi, or you do offloading of pieces of code to the code processor, or you basically run a piece on, on, on the Xeon host and a piece on the Xeon Phi. Even if Xeon Phi physically is a card, it sits in a system, logically you program it, in this case here or here, as a, as a native Linux system. That's, that's, that's really the key thing, and I'll I, I show you then. The next thing will be will be even better. Um, and very often, when, when when we talk to customers, they say, "Ah, oh, 61 cores is nice, but I, I cannot use all those cores, right?" Uh, well, you don't need to use it. It would be nice if you could, but you could also use a subset. <laughs> or you basically you divide your work in in, in, in chunks of pieces where you say, for example, only use um, 16 cores, or four cores, <coughs> or only one core, and then do an MPI parallelism on top of it. So you basically can adapt your application, and this is called hybrid, hybrid programming on a cluster. You use MPI on a higher level, and you use multi-threading with OpenMP, for example, or threading building blocks or silk uh, underneath, and, and then you can, you can target the number of cores you, 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 you want to use according to the, your application, to your algorithm, how much you can use. So it, it, it's not like you use them all or nothing. Um, you can actually kind of split, split the cores up and, and, and do, and, and do the, this hybrid programming. Um, and it works very well, well because, as I said, this, this car, the card runs a Linux operating system. It doesn't matter if, it, if, it, if two two threads communicate within a process, or two processes communicate to each other. It doesn't matter. So that's, a, that's a nice thing. And the way you optimize it, or you, you, for performances, you use cores, you use SIMD vectors, you ideally use blocking and data layout, so you can take full advantage of the cache hierarchy. If you can do all of that, um, you, are, you are likely to get pretty, pretty good performance. If you miss the first or the second one, you are already using quite a lot on the table, you, you also likely lose something if you don't use the cache in a good way. But, well, it depends on the algorithm, how good you, you can use the cache. And the software tools actually will tell you how good your cache hit rate is. The same how good your branch <coughs> prediction is. Uh, what your memory bandwidth is, how much, how much is vectorized, and, and how, how much is parallelized. The software tools uh, we, we, are, we have basically tell you all of this. And both on Xeon and, and Xeon Phi, it's the same. It's the same way you program it, it's the same tools you use. And as I said, you program in, 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 in a higher abstracted way, um, uh, so you are, you are actually portable, maintaining a single source code. And this is again like what, what the, the, the tools do. You, you program for cores, either multi or mini core. You have different, on hardware, you have different sizes of SIMD, um, but the, the software basically does the mapping to the hardware. Um, um, that's, that's pretty good. Um, I, I said SIMD is, is, an, is a good way to get energy efficient performance, um, and it, it will continue to do that. Um, we recently released the next instruction set def definition uh, called AVX 512. It's public. You can download it. Uh, when you look for it, search for it, you should be able to find it. Um, and basically what it does, we, we, are, we are basically extending 
yeah, the, like, uh, the instruction set to 512. This is what Xeon Phi already does. But Xeon Phi has a different instruction set. It's not compatible to, to, to Xeon or to core. It's, it's not compatible. So this is, you basically need to have two binaries. In the future, um, we, we will be going to like a, a, a common instruction set called AVX 512, which is 512 bit thing. So that's, uh, and you see the AVX, AVX2 are 556, SSD was 128, and MMX was 64 bit. So this is like the evolution of, um, of getting more performance through SIM. And we're going wider, which means if we don't use it, you lose performance on the table. The hardware is there. It will, uh, it will be able to help you. Um, this is just, you, know, you can, can read it. I, I can probably uh, send, you, send you a PDF version of it. Um, this basically describes the new instruction set. Um, um, it, it, it has uh, 32 registers. It has uh, eight mass registers. And Knight's Landing, which is the next generation Xeon Phi, uh, will be the first processor to implement this instruction set. And some of the future Xeon processors will also um, use this instruction set. So you will have a common instruction set. And if you, if you like, you can download the, the instruction set document. It's only 900 pages. <laughs> um, and then here, uh, what I show, you, you, the way you, you can program an application, you can, you can either parallelize on a cluster with the MPI, or if you are on an SMP node, um, you, you have threads, and in, in each thread, hopefully, use a SIMD. And when you have like a super vector, you can basically split, split the big vector into, into smaller ones um, across the threads and still use SIMD uh, with, within each thread. And the, you see the difference between Xeon E5 version 2 and Xeon 5 is just the number of cores and the number of threads and the SIMD width. Everything else is the same. And the mapping to this hardware is done by the compiler at the runtime system. And you just parallel, you, you program on a higher level. What, so what does it look like? Every, everyone can read C? So this is a, a very simple uh, example. There, is a, um, there, you know, there are some calculations. Um, they are written in a way to, to allow the compiler to, to inline this code so you, you save the, all the, the, the typing. Um, uh, and that it can vectorize, so it, it does some calculation here. Um, it's actually from a financial application doing some Monte Carlo something, Euro, Black Shorts, whatever. Um, the interesting thing is here, um, you have a loop and you fill an array with uh, this option pricing, Black Shorts, yeah? this says Black Shorts, um, depending on the input data, um, which, which are then the compiler will inline this code and, and generate the code here. So when you run this piece of code, it will run on Xeon and Xeon Phi on one thread. Because it doesn't, doesn't say anything else, right? It runs on one thread on one core. But it runs on Xeon and Xeon Phi, and it vectorizes. So it uses SIMD. It uses 512-bit SIMD on Xeon Phi, and it uses 256-bit SIMD on Xeon. And that's done automatically by the compiler. So so that's fine. Okay, so let's parallelize this one because the calculations are all independent of each other. Right? So you can do them all in parallel. And how, one way to do it is you say you put a pragma OMP, which is sent for OpenMP, parallel 4, and so you say distribute the index set of this loop across all the cores, actually all the threads. And you can set, say, threads equal to number of cores or whatever. Whatever is available. And then the compiler will actually generate the code to, to, to distribute and parallelize this loop depending on the number of cores and threads that are available. On Xeon it's less, on Xeon Phi it's more. But you don't, you don't need to take care. The compiler and the runtime system, as I said again, takes care to do this mapping to the underlying hardware. This is where you, you, stay, you, you stay on a higher level. Right? You say, parallelize it. I don't, I don't want to know all the details, just do it. <laughs> In the, in the way that is best for the underlying hardware. And then you see it still vectorizes and it, it, it parallelizes this loop on, on Xeon and on Xeon Phi. It, it's fine. So it, it runs on both architectures, single source code. Uh, or 
you can say, okay, um, it's, it's only a piece of the code, uh, I want to offload it, right? The cases before were all native. You run the whole application on, on each process. Uh, when you do the offload, you basically, you have another pragma which tells, which, is, which says offload and target, and then you can specify a card. And you can have more than one Xeon file in the system. You, you, they are numerated. Um, and then you can actually specify <coughs> on, on which one. If, 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 if you don't do it by default, it just goes to the first one. It, it finds in the list. Um, and then it will basically, it will run the code uh, up to here on the host. Uh, when it reaches this point, it will basically trigger the execution on the other side. Uh, it, when, the, the, when the binary was loaded, it will know there is a piece which is offloaded. So it will basically, when, when you load the application, it will, it, will, it will know that there's a piece which needs to be offloaded to the card. It will do that. And it will sit there until it's triggered here. When you hit this point, then it's triggered. Uh, it starts running on, on the core processor. Um, you, you do the calculation, uh, and at the end, um, the data basically will come back. Uh, you can you can tell more the compiler what to do with the data, which data to leave, and, and back and forth. Um, it's, it's it's pretty pretty straightforward and, and kind of easy easy to do. But again, this this piece of code runs still on everything else, right? You haven't you haven't really done anything really specific. Uh, that you, you need a different source code. It's it's a single it's a single source code. Um, so that's uh, that's that's really um, that's really nice a, a nice thing. And basically, you, then what you have normally you start with a, with a software application. It, it runs on a Xeon. Hopefully, it's optimized. Maybe not. Um, then you can start optimizing your you, your SIMD, your uh, parallelization, your cache optimization. Then it it, it 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 starts to run actually faster on Xeon. Uh, and then when you still have a high degree of vectorization, parallelization, then you can actually get even more going to Xeon fine. Yeah. Which compilers recognize your fragments? Um, well, it's the Intel compiler, uh, the Intel C, C++ uh, Fortran compiler. Um, uh, GCC, uh, I don't know, GCC supports OpenMP3, I believe. GCC also does some vectorization. Um, there is the latest version of OpenMP is 4.0, which is already supported. Um, so I, I, I would assume that most compilers at one point in time will support it. So the main compilers really in this area is, is are the Intel compilers or, or GCC or, or G or GNU, the GNU comp. What, what happens if, if uh, the processor is not locked and you compile it with, with the option of a microprocessor? Uh, microprocessor? If, if, well, if, well what, what happens? When, when the compiler finds this construct, it generates two binaries, two versions of the loop. Ah. One for the host and one for the car. So when you, when, you, when you run the binary and there's no car, it will say, huh, hey, I, I still have my Xeon binary okay. and, and will execute. Yeah, good, good catch. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And that's a, a benefit by, by maintaining a single source code that you can, you can actually do that. That's, that's good. Um, so what's the next in, in, on, on the Xeon file side? Well, it's, it's a processor called Knight's Landing. That's about the only thing publicly known today about Knight's Landing. It will be the next generation of Xeon file. It will, it will be in 40 nanometer. It will come as a standalone CPU and as a coprocessor, if you wish. And it will have integrated on, on, on package memory. The interesting piece is here, it, is, it, it comes as a standalone processor, which means all the functionality you have in Xeon Phi today in software, you will get in the hardware. Running a, running a, a Linux operating system and being able to do everything a normal, a normal processor can do, even potentially run Windows. Uh, boot itself has its own I.O., its own memory, it's everything. That's, that's, a, that's, that's really the nice thing. And why? Why is that nice? Well, because we want to make it simple. And this is what we call neo-heterogeneous computing. Uh, it started that you, you had a CPU and an accelerator, whatever it was. And you basically had two, two source code versions needed because you pro normally program the accelerator completely different or a lot different. And you have multiple binaries. 
with Xeon Phi, we kind of did the first step. We, we went to single source code. You still have dual binary because the instruction sets are different, right? But you, you, you already have a single binary, a single source code, sorry, a single source code. Uh, and then you, you, are, you run the, the, the respective binary on the CPU, on the coprocessor. And at one point in time in the future, that's the plan. Um, the, you should be able to have a single source code and, and a single binary. And it, it runs just on a CPU. And it, it, then it's just a question is if it's a multi-core or a mini-core. And ideally, they have the same instruction set, right? That's, that's really, I think, making, making things um, much, much easier. OK, so, uh, so this is uh, why simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It's actually from Leonardo da Vinci. Do you, do you know who it's, it's often attributed to, this statement? Uh, it, uh, no, normally, people think that it's, it's from, from Steve Jobs. But it's actually from Leonardo da Vinci. Um, so, journey to exascale. Here comes interesting stuff in, in addition. So, <coughs> there is just the, this is the next big thing in high performance computing. Exascale and one exaflop. What what is an exaflop? It's ten to the eighteenth. So ten to the eighteenth operations per second. That's an exaflop. And you want the performance for different for different application area. Yeah, for climate, for medical, for space exploration, for uh, for new energy, and, and, and much more. Um, and it's and the goal is to do that in twenty megawatt. Twenty megawatt. I don't know if you would be able to fit this system here. Uh, there will not be many, <laughs> uh, many com uh, computer center being able to fit the system. Maybe, maybe by that time. Um, but the interesting thing with Exa, and there will be probably some, a few customers in the world who want such an Exa flood machine. But there's another aspect to it. And it's when you think about it, if you can do an exaflop in 20 megawatts, if you have the technology, you can do then one petaflop in 20 kilowatts. That's an interesting thing. Because that's basically, that's the performance of, a, of the number 20, the 25th fastest machine in the top 500 list in, in a rack. That's like the, what you can do in a rack, 20 kilowatts. Get one petaflop. And then you can also do one teraflop in 20 watts. So your desktop, your high-end laptop, ultrabook, two in one, uh, will be able to run at one teraflop. Or you have 100 gigaflops in two watt. That's 100 times more performance you have today in a, in a modern smartphone. Or you do one gigaflop in 20 milliwatt. That's, that's the interesting aspect, for example. One aspect is that there are some applications who, who want this, this performance. But there are probably even more, much more applications who can benefit from the technology when it kind of waterfalls down. Once you could do it in exaflop, then you, you should be able to do this, 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 this. <coughs> and this becomes uh, very interesting. So this is why, why people are so interested in, in, in exaflop. There are those two, two main, main, main reasons. And that's what makes it so, so interesting. Xeon Phi, based on the many integrated core architecture, uh, is, is one approach we, we are exploring, trying to get to Exaflop. Will we be able to do that? We don't know. It's one option to do. There are probably other options, and uh, other companies are exploring it in different ways. Uh, we are looking at the many integrated core architecture and Xeon Phi as, as, as an implementation, as a product, to basically reach this exaflop by about 2020 uh, in 20, maybe 25 megawatt. That, that's the goal. As I said, will we, will we be able to go there? I don't know. And you can make a calculation. You want one exaflop in 20 megawatt. How many gigaflops do you need per watt to do that? Yeah. 
Any idea? How many gigaflops do you need per watt to do one exaflop in 20 megawatt? Well, it's 50, right? It's 50 gigaflops per watt. And where are we today? Remember, four to six, right? So take the middle five. So we are, we are just 10 times away from it. <laughs> just four, right? So there is still some way to go uh, to, 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 to be able to get there. Um, but um, yeah, we, we, we are trying. And to, uh, we will we'll know more as we go forward um, to, to do that. There are other aspects you need to consider when you go to, to exascale. Besides the processor or coprocessor, the fabric, uh, it needs to scale. Uh, software also, you need to use it as a parallel. When we talk about scalability, people are talking about a billion threads. How do you program a billion threads? That is an interesting question. <laughs> um, it also goes, um, how about reliability and resiliency? Um, you can just do an est estimate. What is the mean time between failure of a component of such an exaflop machine? Uh, it becomes quite interesting. Um, what do you do with memory and storage? Um, what do you do with checkpointing? Uh, it's probably not going to work. You probably spend more time uh, checkpointing than calculation. So you need to come up with something which, which works. And power management and energy efficiency. There are lots of different other areas you need to, to consider. It's not only compute. It's memory, it's fabrics, it's software, it's energy. Uh, it, it's everything together. You need, you need to consider everything. Um, so what's Intel doing? Well, we, we are continuing to push forward. On the compute side, we want to go to a teraflop. Well, we are there. Xeon 5 uh, is delivering this teraflop performance on the chip. Um, we want to go to terabytes of memory bandwidth. Uh, we are not there yet. Uh, we have some ideas how, how we get there. Maybe through 3D stack memory could be an interesting option. Um, but uh, this is the goal. And on the I.O. side, we want to, to go to terabits of I.O. super. Uh, and one technology we are, we are pursuing there is silicon photonics um, to, 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 reach, uh, to reach that, uh, that goal. So those are just the three of the of the areas we are working beside some 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 of the uh, some of the others. So performance is it's all about scalable parallelism, which means um, if at one point in, in the future we have a thousand cores, I don't know if it's true or not, right? But just assume a thousand cores, you would want to have software which scales to that level of parallelism, right? Um, and you do it through data parallelism, which is using SIMD, and task parallelism, which is using the cores and the threads. And the combination gives you, gives you the high performance. And you do it in an, hopefully in an energy efficient way through advanced process technology, new materials, and uh, improved architecture. Um, so that you use the energy in, in, in the most intelligent way, in the most effective, uh, effective way. And there is food for thought. I don't know if you have seen this before. Um, the, the, um, this purple graph shows you the time it takes to add six, to do a 64-bit multiply add operation. And in the good old days, it used to take quite, quite a long time to do compute. Uh, and memory access was faster at that time. But you see over time, kind of in the mid in the 80s, the, those curves cross each other, and all of a sudden you see that you can compute faster than you can get data from memory. Oops. Which is an interesting observation. What it also means is like, I, I remember when I studied informatics, um, we, were, we, we were kind of analyzing algorithms, right? And comparing algorithm is algorithm A better than B better than C, and you you do the cost analysis and everything, and it was normally based on on the data here, where compute was the main part and memory was 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 the fast part. So 
So very often, my memory was completely ignored in comparing algorithms. Well, what happens now, you see that a good algorithm in this time might not be the best algorithm in this time because the characteristics change. Right? It's not, you can compute now much faster than you can, than you can get data get from memory. So maybe you actually recalculate data on the fly instead of getting data from memory. That actually might be faster. And sometimes it is faster, which you would never have done here, right? Because compute was absolute, absolute crazy, uh, very time-consuming part, part. So uh, that's, I think that, that's interesting. I haven't seen really a lot of studies in, in these areas by revisiting algorithms and, and comparing them um, based on, on like the, new, the new scenario that compute is almost for free. Well, it's not for free, but it's, it's very fast. What, what takes time is getting the data from memory. This is why cache, the cache hierarchy is, is becoming more and more important. Right? This is why you want to keep the data in cache as much as possible in space and in time. And with that, thank you very much for staying that long. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, performance and energy efficiency. And uh, you see the road. The road looks like a chip. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And please have you some other questions about the quantity and quality and parallelism. Parallelism is a very important thing for you because we have such special subject in master studies. Uh, we did it but our dean and this problem, several students made the exam several times. Mm -hmm. This is about parallelism. Parallelism is very important and now maybe it will be interesting, more interesting for you to study this subject about parallelism. Some questions, please? If no, yes. Yes, uh, well, how about uh, software transaction memory? Is that implementing so far? No. No, there's, there's no software transaction memory in your file. Um, in Haswell architecture, there is uh, transaction memory, which is like the, the, the current architecture on, on the desktop and on mobile. It's Haswell. Uh, on the Xeon site, it's, uh, it's planned for, for next year. And it will have transaction memory, hardware support. I have a question uh, related to Intel Quark processor. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, out of order architecture or um, in order? It, we haven't specified. Well, I think that the, the architectural description came out like last Friday <laughs> or so. Um, you can. You can probably, yeah, you can, you should be able to download it. I can also send you the link mm -hmm. to, the, to the document. It's also like a 900 page document. Um, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's an x86 architecture optimized for, for low energy consumption. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there was well, the HP company uh, just recently uh, came out with new, new, mm, uh, new idea that servers run on eight atoms, not on cores of CL5. So I, 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 I was really, really uh, surprised that they just go to lower, lower uh, power. Uh, efficiency. Yeah, I guess you refer to Moonshot. Yeah. That from from H from Hewlett Packard. Um, yeah, I mean, basically what Moonshot is is basically is an implementation of what's called a microserver, and a microserver is basically like a small smaller server. Um, it it it's becoming very popular in in a lot of um, web related application or infrastructures like, like web hosting, um, e-commerce, uh, where you have, you, you don't need, say, a, a very strong, a very strong single thread, strong core, but you need lots of them. 
Uh, that's an interesting area. The microservers are, are very interesting. We we actually we announced um, an eight core atom processor exactly for that segment, uh, like two three weeks ago. It's called the Atom C two thousand series. <laughs> um, ever code name Everton. Um, so it, it depends on the workload where where you where one or the other architecture might might be better. Um, what, what we see is that if, if, if your workload is not very I.O. intensive, not very compute intensive, very parallel, and it can tolerate tolerate higher latency, then a microserver might be might be an interesting option. In HPC, all those things are normally not the case. Yeah. Well, they are very highly parallel, but they, they cannot tolerate a high latency. They want fast performance. Um, and and uh, so it's, it's for, H, for normal HPC applications, it might not be so attractive. But there are probably some, some segments, maybe in bioinformatics, for example, um, who could potentially benefit from a microserver. Yeah, it's an, it's a, it's an interesting trend. And we are fully aware, and as I said, we, uh, well, we already have products for microservers today, and, and we'll have more uh, going, going forward. Okay, some other question? I have one more question. Sure. Uh, uh, what is your personal opinion uh, regarding to uh, quantum computing? Because oh. it would change. <laughs> 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 it's, uh, it's, it's certainly interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of research is done. Um, I, I, I personally think it, I still need to, to see it's, it, it entering a stage where it's really usable. Um, because as I said, having something in the lab is one thing. Having a product is, is, is something really different. And not all, not, you're not always are able to, 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 to do that, to move something we have in the lab over to, to, a, to, to a product. It's, it's certainly an interesting, interesting technology, which, which needs to be um, uh, evaluated. I mean, Intel is also um, looking at lots of different technologies. Some of them I would personally call exotic. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's potentially something for for the future, but the question is when, when is the future? Is it five years, 10 years? I don't know. I, I remember people talking about gallium acetate. Uh, was a big hype at one point in time. Didn't really go anywhere. Uh, or Joseph, 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 <coughs> Joseph Junction effect. Fujitsu was working on that. That was also very fancy, fancy technology. I, I haven't heard anything. So um, it's, I think it's interesting, but yeah, it, we, we would need to see. Um, if, if the technology can make the move from, from pure lab to, to say, real life product and manufacture, that's, that's a pretty tough job. <laughs> and does Intel plan to join the research? Uh, I, I cannot comment on that. <laughs> 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 and and, and I, I don't know to be honest. <laughs> Some better question. <laughs> Uh, do you have any clue what the technologies used in uh, current flash memories? I mean, let's say in SD cards. I, I, I explain why why I'm asking because when I when I take just for example 32 gigabytes SD card, so there are 32 gigabytes that is 256 gigabytes inside. That means 256 billion transistors on single chip, and the chip is just only two centimeters times two centimeters wide. Yeah. And so, so the, 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 the error of by one, one transistor is very, very small if it is, if it is done like that. And if I use, let's say, 65 nanometers technology or so, something like that, then I cannot pack it in, in, in such small error. So, so if you have any other, um, some other technologies, like 52 nanometers used or something like uh, that. Well, well <laughs> memory and flash technologies are Using different process technology uh -huh. um, than than logic. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. I, th I think I don't know. What, to be honest, I don't really know what's c the current status. It might be 20 nanometer for flash. Yeah, yeah. could be. Uh, and, and Intel is, is I think Intel is working in this area. 
uh, also some, some other companies. Um, because I think the structures for memory are much more regular, you can, you can optimize the layout. For logic, it's, 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 it's quite different, and that's sometimes a problem when you want to merge those things. Memory, any type of memory, could be a cache or an, or an ED RAM memory with, with logic, right? You kind of need to find a way how you, how you can do it on the same process technology when you integrate it. That's, that's probably a secret with, a, with every company how they do it. Yeah. Because that's, those are the crown jewels <laughs> uh, to, to, to actually do it. Yeah. Yeah. Can I buy a quark core like uh, an IP core and use it to design a system on a chip like ARM cores? Or is it just the chips? You mean the, the SOC? Yes. yes. The quark one? Or which one? Yes, yeah. quark. Uh, yeah, well, well, we have a, we have, we have a um, <coughs> development board, it's called Galileo. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can look it up at the web. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complete board for development purpose. It comes with an SDK. And, um, and that should allow you to, to use it as a, mm -hmm. as a development vehicle. It's, I, 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 I'm not sure, I, I think it's not available today. But uh, it, it should become available pretty pretty soon. Yeah. A big core of this quark. Yes. It was the question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Some other.